All right, so today we're in evil part 14. Isn't it weird you're clapping for evil? Well, you're clapping for a teaching on evil, so that you can understand that. All right, evil, part 14. So again, real quickly, for anybody that's new, just found us and is like, what is he talking about, part 14? Am I going to even understand it? Sure you will. Evil, as we have defined it from Scripture, so as Scripture has defined it, is really focused on something that is the cause of suffering or the source of suffering, injury, ruin, pain, harm, or destruction. Now, the way something is perceived and labeled, right, because we're labeling it as evil, the way something is perceived and labeled is based on how it is understood or seen in the eyes of the one doing it. The person may think they're doing something that, to cause harm or suffering, or they may not. Or it could be in the eyes or understood by the one observing it or the one receiving it or being affected by it, okay? Determining if something is evil is sometimes based on the intent or motive and sometimes about the result, okay? Because somebody may not intend evil, but the people receiving it may think it's evil because it's harming them in some way. But you didn't mean to. You ever try to help anybody and it went badly? You didn't mean to cause harm or ruin or destruction, <laughs> but you did. It also could be that you intended to harm somebody and it didn't go that way. You know, I always often talk about Joseph's brothers, right? They, they intended evil on Joseph and Abba used it for good. All right. So that being said, we're in Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16 and in verse 17. I know we were in Romans two, week, two, two, two teachings ago and then we went to Colossians. I want to just finish this piece up because it kind of flows a little bit after what we did in Colossians. So Romans 16 and verse 17. Now I call upon you brothers, watch out for those who cause divisions and stumbling, contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. For such ones do not serve our master Yeshua Messiah, but their own stomach, and by smooth words and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the innocent. Your obedience indeed is reported to all, therefore I rejoice concerning you, but I wish you to be wise indeed as to the good and simple toward the evil. And the Elohim of peace shall crush Satan under your feet shortly. The favor of our master Yeshua Messiah be with you. Amen. All right, this is going to be fun and unpleasant and evil because I'm going to speak very plainly about what this is saying. And you are either going to like it or not. And that's really not relevant as to whether or not I should say it. Can we all agree? Okay. He says, I call upon you, brothers, verse 17, watch out for those who cause divisions and stumbling. So what is divisions? Those who are trying to bring a separate group out of a group. Dividing the group into more than one group. Okay? Those that are inside of a group, but having a separate group inside of the group or those that come into a group to try to draw people away from that group to another group, whatever that is. We're just using a definition for division. So in a, in a congregational idea, in, a, in the body, as he's talking about here, and he's specifically talking to those that in the letters to the Romans and those in Rome, he's saying, look, I call upon you. So he's at, he's, this is a, a mandate from their teacher, Shaul. I call upon you, brothers, watch out. Watch out for those who are causing division. In other words, you need to be aware that this is happening. And if it's not happening, it certainly could be at any moment happening because it will happen. It happens on a regular basis. He says, watch out for two groups of people. One that causes, or individuals, and it may not be groups. Look for individuals that are causing division. So what, what kind of ways is division caused? Well, if you have a, there's two sort of main ways. One is if you have an issue with the leadership. If you have an issue with the leadership personally and you try to rally others to see that leadership the way you do, that will cause division inside of the group. <clears throat> I hope we can agree with that. Will we agree? That's something that causes division. If you have an issue with the leadership, that needs to be between you and the leadership. Oh, but they're my best friends and they're this and I feel like I need to warn them. There is a way, by the way, to share information that is not also making the effort to get the other person to see things the way you do. 
hey, I just wanted you to know that I had an experience that you might need to know about. You may not feel the same way I do about it, blah, blah, blah. That is maybe the best you can do if you're going to talk about something that you have with the leadership. But when you say whatever you say to try to get them to feel the way you feel about that leader person, now you're causing division. Now you're causing division. So let's be careful that we're not doing that. There's also those causing stumbling. All right, so the first way causes stumbling potentially because if that leadership is actually good leadership and that person is being helped and you cause them to no longer want to be under that leadership and you cause a problem with that leadership in them, then you've caused stumbling. But also we have division caused by and stumbling caused by people that have their own idea that's different than the leadership's idea about how certain things should be or should be done. You have a different belief in something that the leadership has a belief in, but yours is different. And you're allowed, by the way, to have a different belief. No problems whatsoever. I've had a few people come up to me and tell me they have some different beliefs about some things. I said, absolutely no problem. They were worried I was gonna throw them out. I said, we don't throw people out for that. Okay, we've thrown people out for some serious things. That's not serious. It's serious, though, if you're trying to cause division with it. Okay? If you're going to walk around and try to get everybody now to start doing it the way you see it or, or approaching that position the way you see it and not the way the leadership is teaching it. Because that's causing division. And if the leadership was right and you weren't, you're causing stumbling. You're causing stumbling. And so... This is not cultishly saying you can't think differently or believe differently, it's how you handle that. We have some of you here that keep a different calendar or see the calendar different. No problem. This group keeps the one we keep. All right, this group does what we do. We have our reasons, we have a teaching called making the calendar decision, explains why we do what we do. And we would actually expect, I guess we gotta talk about this for a second. Are you a part of the group or not a part of the group? I think that kind of is a question you have to answer for yourself. In other words, is this your congregation that you are a member of, or is this some place you visit? They're both fine, by the way. But you need to act differently with the members if you're not a member, or act differently if you're a member with the members than, than acting like a guest. If you're a member, then you are submitted to the leadership of the group. If you're a member, you will show up on the calendar that we do. No matter what you believe, you may do your own thing privately, that's fine, but you'll show up when we have ours because that's what a member does. If you're a guest, you may come, you may not come, and that's fine, you're welcome to be a guest. We have some people that come here and they go other places and they come here and they go other places, they're guests. And we love our guests and we wanna treat them with respect. And I want you to but be clear in your own mind which you are. Are you a member or are you a guest? Okay, as a member, certain expectations are there. As a guest, certain expectations are there. I expect different and more from a member. That seems to make sense to me. It should probably make sense to you as well. And so I'm much more concerned about a member causing division, a member having their pet doctrines become something they want to rally people behind. I guess we can kind of go ahead and quarantine to whatever degree at some point and say, we don't do that here. And if you're going to keep doing that here, then you need to not do that at all. You need to go somewhere else. A member, we would do the same thing and say, look, you can't do that here. But we may be a little stronger saying, look, you're a member here. You should know better. Because if you're a member here, you should be a member here because of the structure and the leadership and the teaching, not just the fellowship. You can get fellowship in a Sunday church. You can get fellowship anywhere, in any religion, any place they gather, you can get fellowship. You should be here because of the anointing, the teaching, the instruction, the vertical structure. That's the membership, okay? And in that membership, we're mishpacha, we're family. And if we're family, that means the leadership is like the parent which means that sometimes they're going to bless you and sometimes they're going to scold you and correct you. And as a family member, you should be able to handle that. A lot of division actually comes from people not handling that. 
they get their hind quarters hurt. <laughs> trying to find right ways to say this. Right? Like they get spanked. And then they go and they wind everybody. <laughs> Rabbi, talk to me. And Elder Billy, <laughs> you know, if someone comes to you like that, don't enable that. Don't codependent that. Just say to them, hey, you need to deal with whoever you're whining about. Don't come to me with that. Don't empathize and sympathize and then all of a sudden you're having this big pity party and next thing you know, you're thinking about that leadership the same way as that person. You weren't there. You don't know what really happened. And I can tell you right now, you hear one side of any story, you are not getting the whole story. I get a lot of people come to me with issues. A lot of times it's husbands and wives. And if I only hear one of them, I promise you when I hear the other one, it will not match in like big ways. Like really, you guys talking about the same thing? So be careful when your friend comes to you that you just believe everything they say is exactly the way it happened. They may really believe it, but it's not what happened. Some of it maybe, right? But their emotions are creating a distorted reality. Their emotions are creating a distorted reality. And then through that, we end up with division, which then causes stumbling. And he says, listen now, you need to watch out for the ones who are causing division and stumbling. And listen, watch out for those that are doing things contrary to the teaching which you learned. Now we're back to, are you a member? Am I your teacher? If so, wherever you are and you are a member and there's a teacher, you should not be doing anything contrary to your teacher. Now, this is gonna get us into that trouble again where we have come to believe that teachers are just people that stand up and share information for our consideration, okay? That's what we've all experienced. All the stuff that's available on YouTube, all these teachers put it out there is just for you to consider. And that's true on some levels. Ephesians 4 isn't talking about that type of teacher. Okay? In Ephesians 4, maybe just read it real quick. We'll come back to Romans. It says, he, gave him, he himself gave some to be emissaries, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Those teachers are there for the perfecting of the set-apart ones as well as the apostles, etc. But those teachers are there for the perfecting of the set-apart ones to the work of service, to a building up of the body of Messiah until we all come to the unity of belief and the knowledge of the son of, the, of Elohim to a perfect man, to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the completeness of Messiah. Those teachers are anointed and appointed. Those teachers, you need to beware of what's happening in Romans 16 and says, don't go following teaching or teaching anything contrary to those guys. Turn away from people doing that. Turn away from people teaching different than the teacher. I'm not saying that's me. For you, it might be. You need to figure that out. We talked about that many times. But if I'm an Ephesians 4 guy and you have figured that out, then you cannot entertain things contrary to what I've taught you. That's not being cultish. That's between you and him and what you understand my role to be. That Paul tells you there are men who are teachers that are in this category. And he says you should not be because it will cause division and it will cause stumbling, those that are teaching contrary to what you have learned. Learn from who? Paul and the anointed appointed teachers. He says, turn away from them. Oh no, we don't do that. We hang out with them, we listen to them, we go join them at their service somewhere else, we watch all the same things they watch. We're not understanding what we're doing here. And the one person that's really gonna cause the most division in is you. It's gonna cause division inside of you about where you should be. It's gonna cause stumbling inside of you. You can listen to anything you wanna to listen to. You need, according to Ephesians. You don't like Paul, that's fine. But you need a teacher. Not any teacher, like a teacher, your teacher. That doesn't mean you can't listen to other teachings that other people do. But if those teachings are contrary to your teacher, you need to reject that. That's scripture. Oh, it may sound all cultish to you or not, that's fine. It's what it says, and I don't think you can argue with me. But you're saying, but I can't trust a man. That's a problem you need to address. Abba work, works through men. 
Oh, we have earned the distrust as men. For centuries, men have not necessarily been all that trustworthy in leadership positions. But yet always, as Paul has said here, until, we haven't gotten to the until yet, have we? There will be these men that are trustworthy, who you can listen to, who can clarify your confusion with all the other noise you're listening to out there on any subject. Can we all agree that any topic of Torah you can go on the internet and find multiple opinions on? multiple approaches to that don't agree with each other. Can we agree? All right. You can find anybody teaching anything anyway. Any, so whatever you find that you like, if you find that, whatever your preferences that you're hoping it could be, you can find somebody teaching it that way. That's ear tickling, really. You're looking for something that you, as opposed to me teaching in a way to tickle your ears, you're looking for those that are saying what you want to hear. It's the same idea. He says, for such ones do not serve our master Yeshua Messiah, but their own stomach. They're too self-focused. I want to focus on the way I want the calendar to be. I want tithing to be. I want remarriage, remarriage and divorce to be. I want the Sabbath to be. I want holy days to be. I, 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 I. Ay, 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 ay. Ay. He says, the ones who are doing this stuff, they're serving their own stomach. In other words, what feels good and tastes good and you know, for them, their appetites. And by smooth words and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the innocent. Now by smooth words and flattering speech, it's not just they're pumping you up, they're going to say what they can and, 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 and how excited they are about their, their thing that's different. I try to get you drawn into what they're doing. And they're not going to be mean about it. They're going to be pleasant about it and get you excited about it and say, oh, you got it, but you got to see this. Be careful with that. He says, they will deceive the hearts of the innocents. Because especially, so the innocents I would especially believe would be the newest people. I can tell you right now, it is not a surprise to me at this point after 20 plus years of this. But I can always sit there in entertainment slash concern. <laughs> During the oneg, after any service, the oneg meaning the fellowship meal that we have, right? Oneg in Hebrew is delight. And I can watch the same people, the people who fall into this category are the ones that rush up to the guests and quickly friend the guests and then have the guests coming over to their house. Not because it's just so wonderfully hospitable, but because they've got a new one that is maybe not yet convinced about what I'm teaching. It's amazing. Ask Elder Billy, he's seen it. Ask Rabbi Tom, he's seen it. The leadership will tell you, it's incredible. It's not that other people don't go up to the guests. Oh, but those few that I know have their stuff and have their issues, oh, they find those guests so quickly. I've had brand new guests finally come and sit down, not finally, you know, come and see me after the service, after the meal, because we do have time that I do counseling, and they'll so sign up, not for counseling, but a meet and greet, so they get to see me, and they tell me things like, oh, I'll see you at the own egg after the own egg. I go, there is no own egg after the own egg. Oh, well, so-and-so told me there was at their house. Ah. Yes. Not so sneaky, not so subtle. But yet the innocents think that this is something that's official. And the innocents start going into all that. And you know what? I almost always, sadly, this is the sad part, see that it is effective. That people are affected by this. And they end up now thinking like and treating me and the other leadership like those people are doing. They do that. And it's unfortunate. So back to Romans. We're told here, I call upon you. In other words, I'm giving you this assignment. I call upon you as part of your responsibilities to watch out for these people who are causing division and stumbling contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. Turn away from them. You know what? It blows my mind. And again, I have to keep saying, it's not a cultish thing. It's a scriptural thing. It blows my mind to watch you people run up to people you know are causing issues because you've been in conversation where you've heard about that and run over and coddle and grab a hold of and love on all these people that you know are problematic. 
when it says here, turn away from them. Let them feel a little bit of that outcast to wake them up a little bit. We don't want them to be outcast. We want them to knock it off and stop causing division and stumbling. But, oh, but you know what? You guys have a insecurity problem, a self-image problem, and you want everybody to love you. And so you treat everybody in a way that will help make sure that everybody loves you. And yet, it's telling you here, turn away from them. There are a lot of people used to be here. I hold nothing against them. I don't want to hang out with them. I don't have any interest in them because it says to turn away from them. But yet, a lot of you still do it. And you look at me like, but, but they're my friend. Th but they're doing this. Oh, no, they're not. Yes, they are. I've heard three, five, ten witnesses that people who are still talking negatively and trying to drag people off to whatever new thing they're starting and all that kind of stuff. I don't care. There will always be people here for me to talk to, and if there's not, I'll do something else. I want you to understand I don't care from the point of view of, like, losing people. What I don't understand is why you think that there should not be this set apart thing, this separation thing, a loyalty thing. You know, do you not see that all throughout Scripture, the Father and the Son are very concerned with loyalty to them? There's a loyalty issue. You guys are loyal to one person, you. And you want to make sure you're taken care of. Well, if you were part of the congregation as a member, you would always be taken care of. We don't let anything or anybody really fall through the cracks. They may feel like it sometimes, but it doesn't happen. As long as you came to us, we would help you. Sometimes we see it ourselves and we go over and ask if there's something we need, but not always. We're very much busy helping others. And if you came to us, though, we would always do what we can. As long as we're not enabling the problem or entitling the problem, we would help you. Or at least help you think through the problem, deal with your emotions, whatever it may be. But you guys, he says here, listen now, such ones do not serve the master. They claim to. But if you serve the master, then you're not going to cause division and strife and stumbling and teach and follow things that are contrary to the teaching. Now, some of you think, well, how do I know what's contrary to the teaching? Rabbi, you teach one way, guy down the road teaches a different way, guy in this other town teaches another way, a guy over in this other country I get on YouTube does another way. That problem is between you and the one who popped your bubble. That's between you and the Father. You have to go before the Father and say, Father, I know I need Ephesians 4 men in my life. Show me the evangelists and apostles and teachers and shepherds. Okay, show me the, the prophets that I need to be listening to and not just the ones that claim to be. And let him show you and then don't argue with him when you don't like who he shows you. That's where we get in trouble. Because, oh, I don't like that you showed me you. Well, you asked him for the answer. He, he doesn't have to like what you like. He's going to give you the right answer whether you like it or not. <laughs> I can't imagine that all of you, if Paul was your leader up here instead of me, would love him. Some of you would, because some, some of you appreciate and love me. But some of you wouldn't, just like with me, or Moses, or Yeshua himself. Not everybody liked their approaches. Their appro no one person's approach is going to work for everybody personality-wise. It's the information that matters. Can we finally agree that it's the information that matters? Okay? We have, and I'd like to honor somebody, we have somebody here, Billie Jean, who's been here longer than almost any of you from when we first started almost 10 years ago, about nine years ago, a few months after we started, whatever it was. And you know what, Billy, a long time ago, and we had some pretty big divisions in the beginning. She came up to me and she said one thing. She said, Rabbi, I don't care what anybody's saying. I don't care what they're doing. As long as you keep teaching like you're teaching, I'm not going anywhere. Amen?
Because she recognized it's the information that matters, not the personality stuff. And I know a lot of you like this. I mean, you come up to me and say to me, Rabbi, hit me hard and step on my toe. Some people like that. Not everybody. And I, I'm not, I can't change for that. I mean, Abba called me to do this the way I do this. His words, my style. How's that, right? And so I can't do another person's style. The genuineness is part of what it makes it effective. I feel the genuine emotion between, behind my words when I say it, however I'm feeling at that moment, whether it's soft and, 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 or strong and hard, whichever one, it's because that's where I am at that moment and you're getting something real, okay? I'm always gonna be real, all right? He says, we're back in chapter 16 of Romans. These people don't serve the master. They think they do, they look like they do, but they don't. Remember, a lot of people think they do, even almost look like they do, but they don't, okay? He says, your obedience, verse 19, indeed is reported to all. Obedience. It's not just obedience to the Torah as written, but to the leadership as given. Because he's talking about a structural problem here. He says, your obedience, and submission to authority, he says, reported to all. Therefore, I rejoice concerning you, but I wish to, now this is where it comes into the evil thing. I wish you to be wise. Wise mean, meaning experienced and grounded and filled with understanding as to those things that are good. Indeed, as to the good. He says, but I want you to be simple. In other words, someone who really doesn't have experience and understanding and is not well versed in that which is evil. Now he just used that comparison of good and evil in the context of the way we treat our leadership and the congregation and assemblies we're in and whether or not we're causing division or bringing unity. We're causing stumbling or we're encouraging people to stay the path. He called one good and the other evil. I think we need to understand that. Now look at how he then links it to Hasatan. He says, in doing all this, the Elohim of peace, he's not the Elohim of division, and stumbling, in doing so, the Elohim of peace shall crush the adversary. I don't want to put Hasatan in there. Oh, don't ask, don't think I'm changing anything. In the Hebrew, the word would be Hasatan. And I think here he's not talking about a being as much as he's talking about a mindset, an adversarial mindset. When you're causing division, when you're causing stumbling, and you're not submitted to the teaching that you learned, then you are in an adversarial position. Can we agree? And so he's saying, if you can be wise, indeed as to the good and simple to the evil, the Elohim of peace shall crush that adversarial mindset under your feet. He says, the favor of our master Yeshua will be with you. Amen and amen. Agreed. Now, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And one verse we're just going to read here. Verse 33. Because it's connected to what we just read. Now, he's not talking to the Romans. Now, he's talking to the Corinthians. Do not be led astray. Now, you don't warn people about something unless it's likely or possible they could end up there. Do you agree? Why would I warn you about something that would never happen to you? There would be no possibility, no temptation. He says, don't be led astray because you could be. Evil company corrupts good habits. You hang out with those that are doing things that could cause division and cause stumbling and cause harm, ruin, destruction, suffering. This will and can, or can and will, What's it say here? Corrupt good habits. That's when you start doing things slightly off. Your habits of doing things right become slightly altered. Corrupted, right? What is corrupted? It means that it was good, it was fine, and then something has now damaged it, ruined it, is off about it. It doesn't work like it did before. It's corrupted. Anybody ever have a corrupted drive on your computer? Doesn't work right. Sometimes it doesn't work at all. 
And so what he's saying is evil company. What's evil company mean? Spending time with the people that are doing these things will corrupt whatever you have that's good as a habit. It will corrupt it. He says, do not be led astray. So what does he mean by led astray? He says, don't be a fool. Don't, don't convince yourself, yeah, yeah, but I'll be fine. No, you won't. That's what he's telling you. He says, don't, don't be you know, stiff-necked and hard-headed and stubborn. You cannot spend time with evil company. And evil doesn't mean those that are raping and murdering this. Because you wouldn't hang out with them anyway. It's talking about people that are doing things in a congregational setting that are causing harm, confusion, destruction, ruin, suffering. Just so you understand. He says, wake up, verse 34, to soberness righteously and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of Elohim. They don't have that relationship. I speak this to your shame. He's not talking about those outside of the Corinthian congregation. He's saying you inside who think you have and claim you have. He says, I speak this to your shame. He says, wake up. You're acting like you're drunk. In other words, when we're drunk, we're more uninhibited. We have less control of our emotions and we certainly have worse judgment. But we agree that being drunk impairs your judgment. Okay. So Paul's saying exactly the same thing here to the Corinthians that he was to the Romans. Much more straightforward and simply. Okay. Now let's go to 1 Timothy. I'm going to jump around a little bit today. All right, First Timothy, uh, Timothy chapter 6. I'm going to read, this is the last chapter, the first letter to Timothy. Okay, and by the way, I know that people can sometimes get confused. This is a letter to Timothy, not by Timothy, okay? <laughs> All right, but this is a letter from Shaul to Timothy. Now, in 1 Timothy 6, in verse 1, I'm going to read most of this here, if not the whole thing. Let those who are servants under a yoke regard their own masters worthy of all respect, lest the name of Elohim and his teaching be blasphemed. Let those who are servants. Now, we know that the leadership is servants, but he's also saying those who are servants under a yoke. The yoke metaphorically, or the picture of the yoke scripturally, is that of discipleship. Okay, it's a discipleship idiomatic idea. It's a discipleship idiom. So a yoke, which we know you yoke animals for plowing and that kind of thing. He says, in this case, it's teaching. The yoking of a teacher. He says, Yeshua says, my yoke is light. Okay? And so here he's saying, look, be careful. Let those who are servants under discipleship instruction Regard their own teachers, their masters, worthy of all respect. Hmm. All respect. There's a lot of you that have no respect for me and some of the leadership. And that's your problem, not mine. I'm just telling you what Scripture's telling you. Okay? He's saying, look, if you're a servant, under a yoke. But the thing is, a lot of you have no issue here because you're not under a yoke. You have not come under a teacher in a discipleship manner. If I were to ask, how many of you would like to be discipleship, probably every hand would go up. How many would you like to be discipled? All these hands would go up. I mean, let me ask you, how many want to be discipled? Okay, pretty much all the hands are going up. Some of them lower or higher. Some of you are thinking it's been very hot, I don't want to put my arm up. <laughs> the rest of the people next to you are happy you didn't do that, okay. Now, so almost everybody understands that what the father's doing, he does through a process ultimately known as discipleship. Discipleship is not sitting in a classroom with a teacher like in public school or whatever you may have been in, where people just show up as students and there's a teacher and you have no relationship with the teacher. The teacher throws a bunch of information out there, maybe tests you to see if you understand it, and then that's the end of that. In discipleship, there was a very close, intimate trust relationship when you discipled, 
we would call in some industries apprenticing. Because you would disciple as a fisherman. You could disciple as a carpenter back in Yeshua's day. As a farmer, as a shepherd. Matter of fact, in those days, if you were, let's say, a carpenter and your son wanted to be a fisherman, your son would go live at the house of the fisherman and go and live and learn how to be a fisherman. And that person's son maybe doesn't want to be a fisherman. He wants to be a shepherd and goes and lives at the house of the, and goes and does that. Your children would do that when they were old enough to go and get discipled. That's how discipleship worked. And in discipleship, there was this understanding of, it's kind of like if you remember, and I'm, you know, it had its elements of good and bad. If you remember the Karate Kid movie, most of you saw that. Mr. Miyagi with Daniel-san, with Daniel, right? That was a discipleship relationship. And in it, Miyagi would say to Daniel, oh, no, no, no arguing, just do what I say. There's no arguing. Oh, but I don't, shh. If you're gonna argue, you can go away. But I don't understand. I know you don't understand. Do it anyway. Because it's a trust relationship. A lot of you don't understand why would Yahweh put you with me? Rocky says that almost every week. Not in a bad way, he's like, you know, I just don't understand. The question is this though, if it's discipleship that you desire and I'm going to be one discipling you, you have to have enough trust where you're not gonna argue. You gotta know that that one discipling you wants you to be successful at what you're being trained to do. The carpenter training you to be a carpenter. The fisherman training you to be a fisherman. Me training you to be Yeshua, okay? But do you trust that or not? That's really where the big question comes in. Because some of you don't, and I know you don't, you know why? Because you argue. Or you're very proud and you want to make sure I'm aware that you don't agree with everything I say. Uh, by the way, I can tell you, don't be insulted, I'm not being callous here. I could care less. It, it's not my job to care if you agree with me, okay? So I'm not saying like, Phew, I can care less. I just don't have that responsibility to care what you do with what I say. I care that if you would do it and you would listen, that that responsibility is on me to give you the best I can to get there. I care about that. But if you're gonna choose to not listen, that's your problem. I, I mean, I, I will be saddened by that, disappointed knowing that I believe you will end up in a prob problematic place, a challenging place in your walk because of that, you know, rebellion, so to speak, or lack of trust. But some of you have that opposition defiance. You, you just won't take it because it's coming from an authority. If you found it on, on YouTube and you don't have a relationship with the person, oh, I can receive that. I don't know that person from Adam. But from me, who you interact with on a regular basis, no. I, I, I'm just gonna refuse. That stubborn independence that you need to have. You can't do that and disciple. You know, we had a men's discipleship introduction program about seven or eight years ago. I can't remember, but it was a while ago. Gary, what was it, about seven? What, 2015? All right, so 2015. Okay, and our Shamish Gary was in the class. And we had about 25 men in that class, and it wasn't discipleship. I was hoping it could develop into that, but it was really just an introduction. Because it really was hard to do discipleship virtually and we did it on a virtual software like Zoom, but it was something else. Now, that program had one guy one time about three, five weeks in, you know, four or five weeks in, start to argue with me about something. And I said to him, apparently you're not really understanding what this is about. This is discipleship we're talking about, not just a student with a teacher. And if we're talking about discipleship, you are not going to argue with me. If you're gonna argue with me, you're in the wrong room. I'm not saying that you can't argue with me, but you can't argue with me and disciple. Does that make sense to everybody? It's not what that relationship does. So don't claim you're discipling with me if you're arguing with anything I say, because that's not how it works. But I don't understand some of the things you say. So what? I don't agree with some of the things you say. So what? 
You shouldn't be discipling if that mattered. You, should, you know, when, when Yahweh gave the covenantal instruction, when he made the offer in Exodus 19, he didn't explain everything. He didn't even tell them what it was he expected of them except to obey. And they trusted him enough to agree. They didn't know even what they were signing up for. They just said, we know who you are. We saw what you did to Egypt. We saw how you brought us over here to Sinai. All the miracles. Whatever you say has got to be good. We're going to trust you. Of course, they didn't. <laughs> but at least they had that mindset initially, right? And that's really what happens with some of you. You get excited. You come here. You're ready to submit. You're ready for all of this. And then something's going to come up that you don't like that I said or did or that you don't agree with. And now you're going to run for the hills and say nasty things about me. Well, you know, it's foolishness. I'm the same person that you liked initially, that you believed you were supposed to trust and everything else. And I'm going to, as I'm sure even Yahweh has said things you don't like. Yahweh has put you in positions that you don't like and don't agree with. None of you who have family members not talking to you because of a Sabbath issue likes it very much. Yahweh said it, you have to do it, period. Liking it was not part of the program. Trusting it was the program. You understand the difference? And that's going to be the same thing in discipleship. He's saying, look, I want you when you're going through this to understand. Let those who are servants under a yoke regard the ones who are discipling them, the masters. In other words, the vertical. Those over here in the below, in the vertical, you need to respect and give all respect to the one above you. That's the master-servant thing. It didn't say some respect. And I get a lot of people showing a lot of disrespect. Which is fine, I guess, if you're a guest or you just whatever. But if you're, if you're gonna claim you're my student, you're gonna, you're gonna claim a membership here, then where's the respect? Now, some of you online will start saying, well, he always talks about this stuff, you know, you don't have to be, so, I, you don't listen. The respect is not for me. You don't need to respect me for me. It's like forgiveness. Your forgiveness is not for the other person. Your forgiveness is for you. You need to learn to respect leadership because you need to. It's for you. I don't need your respect. I can't do much with you if you don't. But I don't need that. I need to have an audience that some will benefit from what I'm doing so I can share what I'm doing. Because Abba told me, I have stuff for you to say and I will send you people that need to hear it. And we have weed and tares and all that stuff sitting together so some of you could care less. Some of you need to hear every word I'm saying. But I don't want you to think I'm a, because I've, I've had people get in the chat going, Rabbi needs to stop whining. You are not listening. There's no whining. I'm appealing. Like Paul said, I call upon you. If you want what you want, you cannot do it the way you've been doing it. Not about me. If you do or don't, it doesn't affect me. It affects you. I don't know how else to say that. So here, in the letter to Timothy, he's saying, look, if you don't do this, the name of Elohim and his teaching will be blasphemed. Wow. Wow. Not showing respect in the yoking process. He's talking specifically about discipleship here. Because he used the word yoke. If you do not show respect to your teacher, who you're yoked to, some of you think, well, I've never yoked to you. Well, you're losing out. Okay, you're losing out. Why do you say that, Rabbi? Because I can only help you so much until you do that. In other words, because you won't receive beyond a certain point until you do that. It's not that I won't try. Those who are yoked are getting hundreds of times more out of every teaching than those that are not. Yeah, you can clap for that. I saw a few of you. Okay? Because your heart and your mindset is much more ready to receive than those that are not yoked. I'm just another teacher they can find anywhere and listen to for those that are not yoked, okay? All right? Sorry, the camera showed me my seat seat. We're all gathered, bunched up here. I move them around. <laughs> all right? 
Which, by the way, you see this? You can get the camera back there again. Okay, I've got the seat seat on. Why, why would you listen to anybody who's teaching that doesn't have them on? Well, I don't know why you would do that. Why would you listen to somebody who claims to be a Torah teacher who is not wearing seat seat? Oh, my teacher says he wears them inside. That's a nonsense. Look, if I was a teacher who wore them inside, and I found out that it was an issue for some people who were confused, I would immediately start wearing them outside. Just so that that question isn't a question, because it causes a stumbling. It causes confusion. You know, when I listen to teachers, when people send me links and other things, one of the first things I do is look for the seat seat. If that camera can get me any angle where I can see the hip, of that teacher, I'm looking for the strings. I'm looking for the tassels. Because that does affect my understanding of where that person is in their walk and their hypocrisy or not, and their commitment or not. It's a measuring stick. Can we agree? All right. And so, I mean, some things are more obvious than others. Some of you still listen to Sunday teachers because you still like them. That's ridiculous. That's insane. You know better. Oh, but, but, no, but, but. I'm not saying a Sunday teacher can't teach something of value, but why would you listen to people in the wrong camp? Because people will come to me, especially about prophetic things. Oh, but you, no, no, no. I do not listen to Sunday teachers. Period. I don't care how good you think they are. I don't care how, what insight you think they have. My first question is, are they Torah observant? Are they covenanted? No, I don't have any ear for them. Okay? No. I'm not going to give myself a chance to fall into any level of confusion. But yet you do. Shame on you. This is actually mentioned by Paul as being ashamed. And so we have to be very careful with that. And the wind blew my page. Here we go. So, he says here, let's continue into verse 2. And those who have believing masters, let them not disregard them because they are brothers, but rather serve them because they are believing and beloved ones. Those receiving of the good service in return, teach and urge these matters. He's saying to Timothy, look, they really need to have an extra special respect and service to those who are believing and are in leadership, okay? If anyone teaches differently and does not agree to the sound words, those are a master Yeshua and to the teaching which is according in, to reverence, in other words, those teaching on behalf of Yeshua with their reverence for Yeshua, he says he is puffed up. Oh, I've been called puffed up by everybody, that's fine, but it's my job to be up here and do what I do. Now, unless you are an Ephesians 4 teacher, you should have nothing to say about what I do. If you're not an anointed appointed, how are you to know that I'm wrong? I don't understand how you would think that. I've said this before and gotten a lot of people mad at me, and that's too bad. Don't be offended by these words, but they're serious words. When you think the teacher is wrong, what thinks you're qualified to think that? What are your qualifications to say the teacher is wrong? That's pretty audacious, isn't it? You got a lot of audacity to say, because I get people sending me letters and booklets and saying all the stuff that they think I'm wrong about, whatever it is. Usually it's prophetic stuff or calendar stuff or whatever. And you know what? I just throw it out. So for all of you out there that are gonna mail me stuff, you need to know I've not read any of it. I have given it sometimes to Rabbi Tom or somebody just to read through it and let me know what it was. I am not reading it, okay? Not because of any anger or this or that. I don't have time to waste on whatever you think I'm wrong about. Abba thinks I'm wrong about something, he'll show me. But that's what he's doing when I sent it to you. No. 
I need to know what your qualifications are before I'll listen to you. You need to know what the qualifications are before you listen to anybody. And by the way, just listening, if it's something like this, you should hear the qualifications just coming out of my mouth. If you don't, if you don't see that there's a difference, then I don't know what you're listening to. And that's not bragging. Or, I just know I go all over the place looking for anybody that sounds like me. Oh, I got people telling me all the time, oh, this guy over here sounds like you. Well, maybe he has a New York accent. That doesn't mean he sounds like me. And there's a guy in Georgia that has a New York accent, and I really don't think we sound even similar in our accent. But the point is, it's the message that I'm saying sounds or doesn't sound like. Is the bluntness and straightforwardness and the point without coddling and ear tickling, is it what it needs to be? Oh, Rabbi, this guy, okay, whatever. I don't know. I will listen. I will try. But I want to know. So I'll go and check out. People will tell me about people. I will check out and listen to one teaching. I'll check out and see what they're doing. But if you just send me something without calling me first and discussing it and letting me know you're sending it, it goes right in the garbage. That's not because I'm offended or insulted. It's because he has me doing a work and I barely can get that done. I don't know if you guys understand how much I work. I'm not asking for sympathy. I'm not trying to make you go, oh, wow. But I don't think you know anybody that works as much as I do. Not certainly in the ministry. I remember having pastors and they'd be there for the service and you'd never see them. Our service runs and then we eat and then I counsel until midnight or one in the morning, like last night. When I'm, anytime there's nothing else that I'm already doing actively, I'm doing something more except eat and sleep and spend some time with my family. And my family, thankfully, doesn't need a whole lot of time because they get what I do. And so I don't have time for all of that. Look what he's saying here. He says, if anyone teaches differently and does not agree to the sound words, those of our master Yeshua and to the teaching, which is according to reverence, he is puffed up, understanding none at all, but is sick about questionings and verbal battles from which come envy, strife, slander, wicked suspicions, worthless disputes of men, of corrupt minds and deprived of the truth, who think that reverence is a means of gain, withdraw from such. He doesn't play around. He's telling it like it is. So in case we're just thinking verse three is only talking about scripture. If anyone teaches differently and doesn't agree with the sound words of Messiah, Yeshua, he's talking about those that are, listen now, they're sick about. In other words, that's, they're, they're obsessed with questionings and verbal battles and envies and strife and slander and disputes of men. This is corrupt. This is coming from a corrupt mindset, a damaged mindset, a mind not in a healthy enough place to receive sound teaching because it's polluted by too much me, 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 right? It's, that's what corrupts it. What, what do you think all this corrupted stuff is about? Oh, it's not Hasatan, don't blame the demons. It's you. Your problem that corrupts your head and your heart is your head and your heart, <laughs> okay? That may have been too straightforward for you. Let me say it again. The problem that, has, that causes the corruption in your mind and in your heart is your mind and your heart. Me, 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 I don't like, I don't want, I like, I want, when it's in conflict with what he says. And he doesn't just say it in the book. He has Ephesians for people all through scripture to teach this stuff. I have referred to them as the Melchizedekian priesthood because we see that's what Melchizedek and the priesthood of Melchizedek did. They taught and instructed people in Torah. Now, don't tell me the Aaronic, you know, the Levit Levitical Aaronic priesthood was that. No, they weren't. They were those who taught temple service and they were judges as to certain things according to Torah. So if you had a blemish, you would go to the priest to look at it. There were things that you went to the priest for, for judgment. 
They were part of the judicial system. But the Melchizedekian, which is Moses' side, not Aaron's side, the 70 that got anointing off of Moshe, the 12 that Yeshua trained, he trained them to be Melchizedekian priests. That's what discipleship was. Not the Melchizedekian teaching that's out there trying to tell you that some Torah that you don't have to do and everything else. I'm talking about the function of those of the order of Melchizedek. That order is about teaching you what you need to transform you into the high priest, Yeshua himself. Amen? All right. Let's see what else we can get into trouble with. He says, this is worthlessness, the disputes. Worthlessness. You know, in Titus, hold your place here. But in Titus 3, he says the same thing. It's in verse 9, he says, but keep away from foolish questions and genealogies and strife and quarrels about the Torah. Stop arguing about it. For that is unprofitable and useless. You know, there are those who've come here. They didn't stay long. But they've come here, and they will come up to me and tell me how much they love to just debate Torah and get into a, a good midrash about Torah. And really what they're saying is they love to share their opinion. They want people to hear them. They want to argue their point. I said, that's not going to work here because we're not here to debate. We're here to learn and be discipled. And so he told Titus, he said, this is useless. There's no profit in it. Yet some of us are just drawn to it because we love it. Because it gives us a chance to sound smart and be smarter than somebody else to show everybody how smart you are. I don't want you to think I'm smart. I want you to take the information and be changed. Okay? I'm not here to wow you and impress you you know, there are other teachers out there that will get into the Hebrew or the paleo and the this and the that, and I can impress you with all that if I wanted. They don't point to it. I need to give you, as Yeshua did and throughout Scripture, everything in its simplest, straight form. This needs to be simple and straightforward. Somebody mocked me one time and said, the simplicity that is Christ. You know, it was a Christian guy and was attacking me because I took you know, 14 parts to teach something. Why did it take me 14 parts to teach it? Was it because I had a problem teaching the simplicity or because you guys have a problem receiving it? Think about it. It could be taught very simply, but not when you're fighting it, arguing with it, and all of what I'm teaching is swimming upstream against what you always were told. Now I've got to make an iron, iron cast or ironclad case that can't be fought against by going to every verse that talks about it. And every verse you're going to say, but what about over here? You know. And so I have to address all that. I can't do that in one simple, straightforward teaching. So you're the problem, not me. We've, we've spent 14 weeks just trying to understand evil. And you know what? It's been incredible because you need to understand. I could have made it much more simple, but you wouldn't understand all the areas that it affects, all the ways that it comes into play, all the ways that we cause it, create it, and when Abba brings it, because a lot of the evil comes from him. He brings suffering into your life with purpose. Because it talks many places about him bringing evil, or he says, and if you would repent, I would relent of the evil that I brought. I would cease the evil. Because we, we were all taught in church that evil is often the demons and the devil. Not scripturally. Scripturally, they get almost no credit for any of it. You get most of it, and Elohim gets the rest of it. You cause suffering to others and yourself. Elohim causes suffering to others and you, not himself. Although he does have disappointment watching us do dumb things that hurt ourselves. Just like any parent doesn't want to see their children do dumb things that hurt them. 
Let's continue. Where are we now? Okay. After saying all of this in verse 5, he said, again, withdraw from these people. Oh no, you guys run to them and hang out with them and are drawn to them. It's not me. Don't get mad at me. Paul is saying this here like he said it to the Romans. By the way, Yeshua says it in other places. The Father says it. He says, come out of her, my people. All you want to believe is that's the church. No, he says, come out from amongst all of those that are not covenanted, that are causing you to be tempted to be not covenanted or to break covenant, to get drawn into where you can stumble. It's very straightforward. He says, withdraw from such. He says, but reverence with contentment is great gain. Reverencing what? Those who are teaching you. And the teaching itself. Show it reverence. What does he mean by reverence? A certain level of awe and respect is reverence. Okay? When I talked about in the fear of Yahweh teaching, the idea of reverence, is to, in revering you have a level of desire not to disappoint and let down because of the level of awe and respect. I don't want to let you down because I have that level of awe and respect for you. That's the reverence. Not reverence that's inappropriate for a man to get. We should have that kind of reverence for parents, for our leadership, because we should have a certain amount of awe and respect for their position, for the anointing, and for their caring enough to try to help us get where we need to go. All right? And by the way, I really appreciate the ones that do come up from time to time and tell me how much they appreciate my willingness to say what needs to be said, whether people are going to like me for it or not, because they, they know and they feel how much I care about them getting where they need to go. Okay? All right. Now, he says, verse 7, because he says, by the way, in verse 6, he says that reverence with contentment brings great gain. It's not just reverence. It's reverence with contentment. Some of you are not content with being here or wherever Abba has placed you. You're not content with the teacher not being the way you would like the teacher to be. You don't get to mold the teacher into your image of what you want the teacher to be. There is a teacher, and Abba will give you that teacher. And that teacher is what he is. But Rabbi, can't you? No, I can't. He, he, he chose a hammer. He didn't choose a tickle feather. So you're going to get a hammer. Now, it's a blunt instrument, but it is what it is. But you know what? When something is really hard and you need to get something into it, a feather's not going to work. A hammer is what you need. A good, strong, heavy one that's going to lay a blow on that nail into that wood. Verse 7. For we, we brought nothing into the world and it is impossible to take anything out. When we have food and covering, we shall be satisfied with these. But those wishing to be rich fall into trial and snare and into many foolish and injurious lusts which plunge men into ruin and destruction. That's evil. Now, verse 10 is the verse that actually is one that we're trying to get to here as far as the evil. It says, for the love of money is a root, a root, not the root, of all kinds of evil. Not all evil, but all kinds of evil. And the way the wording is there, it's the love of coveting, the the coveting of gain. Not the love of having the money, but the coveting of gain. In other words, about you being the recipient and endpoint of the gain. That's the root of all kinds of evil. Because if you want it bad enough, there's things you'd be willing to do to get it that you shouldn't do. So all kinds of harm, suffering, and ruin can come out of the the unrestrained coveting of gain. The more you want something, the more you will do things you really shouldn't to get it, whatever that is. Can we agree? All right. So 
let's be careful with that. Now, he didn't say money is evil or even having money is evil. It's the coveting of money that can be a root of evil. It doesn't say that it is in itself. It says, but it is the root of all kinds of evil. In other words, it's the root cause of all kinds of evil. He says, for which some by longing for it have strayed from the belief and pierced themselves through with many pains. There are a lot of you here right now who are suffering financially because you don't tithe. Because you think it's your money. I know Elder Billy on the Stop Wasting teaching the other day said, it's not your money. And you get confused thinking it's your money, but it's never been your money. Abba allows you to have 90% of it, or really 80% and then some of your 70%, but it's never been yours. But you think it is. Well, I worked hard for this money. Yes, you did. Still not yours. If you have ability to make money, who gave you that? Who gave you the skills and the talents that you have? You know, in Deuteronomy 8 and a verse, let's see, do I want to go to 18 or earlier? All right, let's begin in like verse, 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 let's see, 10, okay? He says, and you shall eat and be satisfied. This is why at the end of our meals, I didn't get to do that today at lunch, I apologize. But at the end of our meals, I usually ask a question. Have you eaten and are you satisfied? Because it says here, you shall eat and be satisfied. And shall bless Yahweh your Elohim for the good land which he has given you. Or in other words, the ability, the place, the, to have the abundance that you have to eat and be satisfied. But you need to be on guard lest you forget that it's Yahweh your Elohim. Okay, by not guarding his commands and his right rulings, his laws, which I command you, that lest you eat and be satisfied and build houses, dwell in them, your herds and your flocks increase, your silver and gold increase, and all that you have is increased, that your heart then becomes lifted up. And you forget Yahweh your Elohim, he brought you out of whatever bondage you were in. In this case, he says, Egypt in the house of bondage, Mitzrayim, who led you through the great awesome wilderness of your life, fiery serpents, scorpions, thirst, where there was no water, who brought water for you out of the flinty rock. In other words, he provided for you where you saw no way, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know in order to humble you and to try you and do good to you in the end. And then you shall say in your heart, oh, my power, my strength, my hand have made me all this wealth. He says, no, verse 18. You shall remember Yahweh your Elohim. It's he who gives you the power to create the wealth, to get the wealth. And this is the reason. In order to establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is today. Now we could take that in two ways. The one main way is he's doing it to establish that in the covenant he promised you to have all this if you obeyed all of what he said, all of what he said. Also, with that wealth, he could use that wealth to support the message going out as in, to other places. But that's a very small secondary piece to this particular verse. He's saying is that this wealth is to establish that what he said is true. I gave you the wealth because I said I would. But if you don't do, and you start thinking it's all about you, it's gonna go bye-bye. That's Deuteronomy 28, the blessings and cursings, right? So Deuteronomy 28, where it says in verse one, it shall be if you diligently obey the voice of Yahweh your Elohim to guard all his commands which I command you today, that Yahweh your Elohim shall do all these wonderful things. And by the way, did you notice that the wonderful things is a lot less verses than the bad things? You only get 14 verses of the wonderful things. And then from verse 15, all the way towards the end of the chapter, another 40 something verses about all the cursings. Because he says, if you do these things, I'm gonna set you high above all the earth and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey. So this is what he was talking about in chapter eight, okay? Where he says, I would give you all this abundance to establish my covenant. Don't let the churches tell you it's so that you can give the money to the church or whatever. So that does work, but that's not what he's talking about here. He promised you abundance in, for your obedience. And look at what it says, though, in verse 15, though. 
and it shall be if you don't obey. <laughs> the voice of Yahweh, your Elohim, to guard, to do all his commands and all his laws, which I command you today, that all these curses shall come upon you. That also establishes his covenant. When he says it and it happens, that helps establish his covenant. Okay? Now, let's go back to 1 Timothy, where we left off. Actually, we're already an hour and 10 minutes in, so I need to stop. Let me just see where I was in 1 Timothy. If I can turn there, chapter 6. He says that in this pursuit of the wealth, it's caused them many pains. You know, a lot of you are suffering here at the feast because of the second tithe problem. You don't think that you need to tithe. That second tithe is why you suffer when you come here. You feel broke, you feel like it's wrecking your budget, you feel like you're gonna go home and suffer because you didn't put it aside. There are a few people here that are absolutely popping out of their skin not knowing how to deal with the abundance they have here for this week because they did put away their second tithe. And they have more money to enjoy themselves with than they know what to do with. If you only make $15 an hour, that's 30,000 a year, that's $3,000. Spend that on two big feasts, that's $1,500 to be here for a week. You can live pretty good on that. That's just 30,000. What if you have a husband and wife both making that? Now you have 3,000 for each of the two feasts. 3,000. You can go eat whatever you want at any restaurant. Stay in the nicest hotel, do whatever you want. Oh no, you're telling me you can't afford to come because you don't have any money. You know why you don't have any money? Because you don't obey and you have no discipline. Those are the two reasons, don't get mad at me. You know it's true, period. If you had the discipline, and if you were obedient to the commands, you would have the abundance. He doesn't lie. When you don't tithe, you're only hurting one person, you. If you got children, you're hurting your whole family and your spouse. I don't need your money. Abba will pay me and put money into what he wants done whatever way he wants. Do you understand that? That's why we never ask for it. We don't send out solicitations. We don't have a, an offering thing that goes on the screen and have people come up and whatever I've seen congregations do. I'm not gonna embarrass you and make you walk up here in front of everybody and put something in a box. I put a box in the back of the room. If you put it in, I'll never know. I'll never see you over there. That's between you and him. We don't ever lack what we need ministerially, I promise you. Because Abba is behind it, not you. Okay? If, do not be insulted by this, but if anything the Father is doing depended on you, it would never work. People are not dependable. So thank Yah that nothing he does depends on us, okay? He doesn't need you to do it. He said, I could raise rocks to do what I want. He has chosen you. He has given you the blessed opportunity to be the one he does this through. He doesn't need you, he wants you. That's much better, that's much better. He wants it to be you, he doesn't need you, okay? We'll close with verse 11, but you, O man of Elohim, flee from all this. See, again, he's being strong about you not spending time with those doing these things. He said, pursue righteousness, reverence, belief, love, and endurance, and meekness. Okay? We'll continue with this tomorrow. But this is the strength of it. I want us to go before the Father about these things. Father, we come before you. And Father, this is tough. Because in our flesh, in the below, we are very insecure. We need relationships and love. And when we find them, and it happens to be people that are not the people we really probably should be with, it's hard to let that go. But the people we should be with, we're not connecting with that way. That's tough too. And shame on all of you who are not making yourselves friendly to those that are in. And you spend your time being friendly to those who are out. It makes no sense. Father, help us to figure this out and to adjust ourselves and our focus and our mindset and our approach to be in line with yours. 
give us strength to make those hard choices. We do not want to be misunderstanding and being a part of what causes division and strife and stumbling. But Father, yet we understand that that causes suffering and pain and ruin and just, it causes evil to abound. We know you don't desire that in the body. Help us to make sure that we're not the ones that are causing any of that, nor participating in it, nor spending time with those doing it, but that we are focusing on pursuing what is righteous, what is right, and embracing and spending our time as much of, as we can just in that one place. So Father, we thank you. We thank you for your patience and your mercy and your kindness towards us. We ask for strength and encouragement as we do these difficult things, and we do all in the name and authority of the one who set us the example, our Messiah Yeshua. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.